Welcome to Info Insight. I'm Miles Eversley. Thanks for joining us. This is sargassum seaweed. It is inundating our shores and has become a nuisance. This unwelcomed marine vegetation has proved to be a challenge for Caribbean states. To date, we have not been able to prevent it from reaching our shores. Therefore, how could we turn this challenge into an opportunity that could be of benefit to us all? Well, a Barbadian company is doing just that and more. It is making use of seaweed, distillery wastewater and manure in the production of biofuel for transportation. The founder and CEO of Raman Sargassum Incorporated and lecturer in renewable energy at the University of the West Indies Cape Hill campus, Dr. Legina Henry, speaks of the concept of using these waste material as a source of biofuel. So you have a bunch of students behind you and they are undergraduate second year students in a course called Sustainable Energy Systems that we run, um, ENSC 2003, on Cave Hill campus. And in 2019, which was my first year lecturing here at Cave Hill, we, we were excited to talk about this new p policy in Barbados, 100% fossil fuel free by 2030. And we talked about different parts of the renewable energy transition. And one of the things that came up was transportation. So if you drive through Barbados, especially compared to other Caribbean countries, you see a lot of electric cars. And so the question came up in class one day, OK, Dr. Henry, one of my students at the front goes, I can't buy an electric car. What's, what's going to happen to me when the whole country transitions away from fossil fuels? And we thought, OK, yeah, good question, because I don't think most of us in this room probably don't think we could buy an electric car before 2030. That was in 2019. And so a bunch of us kind of gathered around the problem. I chose some of the best students in that cohort. And we sat down for um, eight weeks in summer 2019 and started looking at various parts of the Barbados economy to see, is there a way for a biofuel solution? in a country that's transitioning away from fossil fuel driven traffic. We started off looking at Brazil because two thirds of road traffic in Brazil runs on sugar cane. And so we like, can Barbados be this little tiny Brazil in the Caribbean Sea um, with the same solution of sugar cane driving road traffic? And the answer swiftly proved to be no, that the feedstock, the cane feedstock, and what would have been produced on a good recent year wouldn't be enough to, to power even 6% of road traffic. So that, that scale of that solution was not the answer. One of my students, Brittany, she's on the van heading home, drives past mounds of sargassum and seeing all these cranes and all this activity around moving sargassum off the beach. She comes to my office the next day and she goes, Dr. Henry, why don't we look at sargassum as a feedstock? Um, and this is like two weeks this is three weeks into this summer program where we drove around to all the sugarcane breeders association and we basically started to really understand sugarcane so my head was deep into sugarcane and for her to come and go why do we look at sargassum i'm like hmm all right Brittany, you seem to be really enthusiastic about this idea if for the next six weeks you can be this enthusiastic go ahead and run some experiments on sargassum <laughs> So we took a lot of what we were doing before, which is we went and met with the distilleries and we were trying to understand the industry. Um, so we did collect wastewater from the distillery and we went ahead in the lab and started testing methane output from this sargassum seaweed with um, distillery wastewater, followed all of the protocols according to some of the experts in the biochemistry department on this campus and came up with what I'll call now, which is basically three and a half years after that experience, a predictable, stable formula for producing methane from a mix of different local um, waste streams. Beyond that, my training is in mechanical engineering, and um, I'm a renewable energy enthusiast and expert, but my PhD is a mechanical engineering PhD, and as a context, and we looked at oceanic solutions, so understanding waves, the dynamics of ocean waves, currents, um, marine hydrodynamics. So that does filter into this solution, understanding how does sargassum drift across the ocean, 
we're seeing in the scientific community a stream coming off of West Africa, coming across the Mid-Atlantic, going near to the, the, the runoff in South America, getting all of that nutrition blooming up and then coming through the currents into the Caribbean Sea. That's the path Sargassum is taking. And so I like to see it from a numbers standpoint because of my engineering training. So we started looking at, well, was the volume of the feedstock coming at us? was the volume of the feedstock needed based on our lab experiments and started comparing road traffic. Um, at the same time, we looked, we took a deep dive into the electric vehicle rollout for Barbados using data. So we, we pulled open data sources like Google Maps and other freely available sources of traffic data for Barbados to look at well, how much energy does, does road traffic need. And yeah, we looked at the numbers the arriving sargassum is comparable in scale to the energy being used in road traffic in the country. And so I applaud all the solutions where you're seeing practitioners and entrepreneurs around our space in Barbados using sargassum for useful output. Great. And we're saying the solutions have to now start matching the scale of arrival of sargassum. Um, so we do see products like agricultural products, um, cosmetics. We see sargassum being exported to Europe for plastics, etc. But we're saying the solution of road traffic is a local at scale need for the arriving feedstock. And we think looking at the principles of sustainability and something that could really economically answer the, the arriving sargassum problem which is a crisis for tourism, is a crisis for fisheries, is a crisis for anybody whose livelihood depends on that beach. Meeting that crisis at the scale that is arriving, um, we think this solution is that. And so that is the story of rum and sargassum. We found good results in the lab. Already I'm the renewable energy lecturer at UE Cable, so other questions were coming on my desk at the same time about electric vehicle rollout about writing a dossier of the energy story of Barbados. And so I saw the sargassum solution in that context and we started matching numbers and seeing, yeah, it's a good fit. Um, beyond that, we're in a small island. And for most small islands, if you look at the integrated resource and resilience plan for Barbados, which is the technical description of how the country will go from basically fully fossil fuel driven to fully renewable um, powered. Biomass fits 5% of that whole energy mix. The majority goes to wind and solar. And I think it makes sense because we are a small island. We do have the rolling fields of Europe and Asia to go and grow acres of grass to drive road traffic. We don't. Land is a commodity in a small island. But this is an oceanic feedstock. We are large ocean states. And we're seeing in our beautiful, massive, exclusive economic zone, which is 435 times the size of the land in Barbados, you have this big feedstock nature is bringing to us. And to turn up that crisis into a massive opportunity, um, I think would be a beautiful thing. And so that's the thing we're going after in Raman Sargassum looking at sargassum, not only as what are the potential solutions, but looking at it in terms of scale and numbers and seeing that it is a fit. Dr. Henry discusses the principles which guide this venture, sustainability being at the core. It could be exciting to think of a small island that's fully solar and wind powered. That's just beautiful. That's just a romantic thought. And for somebody like me who, I call myself a renewable energy enthusiast, living in Barbados, being the first island to do that in our region, that's great. But I think our guiding principle has to be sustainability. It can't, you can't think um, just because we walked away from fossil fuels, it means we're doing it right. We have to walk away from fossil fuels in, in a way that is sustainable, in a way that is economically viable, and in a way that respects um, you, you think about how much of the human resources in Barbados are energy um, technicians, experts, 
um, practitioners. And so people who know how pipes work and how valves and pumps work, do they have to now figure out how solar PV works because now they have to shift? And so that's years of training and expertise. They've been working on the, there's a massive um, natural gas pipe network in Barbados. Um, that those, assets, those physical assets, the people who specialize in maintaining them, um, to tell them one day, okay, job over forever. We're not using this gas network anymore because we're all good and fossil fuel free now. Is not um, probably not in the best interest of the Barbados economy and a lot of the physical assets that are already here. I think um, again that approaching the energy transition with biofuel at the heart of it is a wise thing for not just Barbados, but most of the Caribbean has their um, renewable energy transition goals. Even for the year 2030, I think Trinidad has this goal to be 30% fossil fuel free by 2030. And different islands have their different rates of um, renewable transitioning over the next 20, 30 years. And I think biofuel for all of us, especially given the sargassum crisis, Biofuel needs to take a greater role in those conversations and in all of that braining out of how you're going to transition your fossil fuel sector into a renewable energy sector. So our mission is to see most of road traffic driving on sargassum-based biofuel. Um, our mission and our big, hairy, audacious goal is to see easy access points for any driver in Barbados to go and fill up and have a easy access to good, reliable supply of biomethane for driving. You may now be curious as to what biofuel is and how it is produced. Dr. Henry places it in perspective. Biofuel is the same carbon and hydrogen atoms that you find in your octane and in your natural gas, which is methane. It's, it's CH, methane is CH4. Um, octane is C2H8. Um, it's just the, about the numbers of the carbon and hydrogen atoms in the molecules for, for each different kind of fuel. What's the difference with our carbon compared to fossil fuel carbon? Well, fossil fuel carbon is something that nature millions of years ago said, you know what, I'm done with you. I'm putting you away. Rest in peace. It was nice knowing you. And it went down into the fossils, deep down into the fossil reserve. Biofuels take the carbon that's already here in our biosphere and those beautiful green trees outside in, in all of the um, organic matter around us. It's just cycling it through a natural cycle. It's just like a tree is born, fruits, uh, fruit drop from a tree, you see little sprouts come up and that old tree dies one day, but you have new trees. You think of how bananas work and you see that happening right there in your yard in real time. Um, Biofuel is just part of that whole process of nature. Fossil fuels dig up. They say, oh, wow, look at all this good stuff nature put away millions of years ago. Let's just use it. And so there's this graphic called the Keeling Curve. You can see the Industrial Revolution and from the 1950s, this massive upturn in atmospheric carbon. And that massive upturn is a sign of science and progress, yes. It's a sign of industrialization. It's a sign of people having longer life expectancy and fancy smartphones and nice cars. But it's also a sign of ignorance and that we found this resource of, in the fossils and just went after it, not knowing the harm it would do. But at this point, we're at a point of no return where we're saying, this is harmful for the atmosphere and we need to stop. And so, Biofuel say, stop bringing new carbon into our atmosphere. Let's just keep the carbon we already have. Um, and that's the difference. So people go, well, isn't it producing carbon dioxide when you burn methane in your engines? And I'm saying, but that's carbon that was already naturally part of our biosphere. By switching over to biofuel, what you're saying is, stop bringing new carbon out of the fossils. Leave it there. Nature knew why she put it away. Let's not keep playing around with new carbon. Leave what's in the, fossils, in the fossils and work with what has already been put here. So our primary product is biofuel for road traffic, for road transport. Of course, the same biofuel could be used to power 
generators and put power back into the grid. Right now there's a 44 cents per kilowatt hour incentive in Barbados for less than 10 megawatts where you could be profitable just producing electric power from biofuel. So that, that is a potential product, but our focus has been transport because that I think is something you're not hearing enough of when you hear the conversations around um, the transition. So I do have a PhD student looking at the role of electric um, transport and e-mobility in the transition, um, but we're seeing there's more of a place for scaled up biofuel um, than we have been saying when you talk about how you transition transport away from fossil fuels. So yeah, um, transport fuel, but our fuel is basically the same form as compressed natural gas, CNG. And so CNG cars is what you're gonna need to drive on our fuel. You don't need to buy a new car though. Any gas car, I'm guessing the car you drove in could have been a gas car that you drove here, yeah, mine too. No shame in that as yet. So, um, so my car is actually the first car we're gonna convert. We're, we're right now in the middle of a conversation with a local energy company where we're setting up a pilot. And by June, I'm going to be driving my car on this fuel. Um, I'll say Trinidad is a good benchmark for CNG traffic. Over the past few years, thousands of CNG conversions happen in Trinidad. And I say conversions because it's not really a conversion. What it is is an upgrade because your car could still drive on gas, but you have the option of driving also on this compressed natural gas. In Trinidad, CNG costs 14 TT dollars for one week fill up. 14 TT dollars is like three, four Barbados dollars. It's between three and four Barbados dollars for a week. Imagine that. I just paid 200 dollars to fill up my tank. <laughs> so the thought of paying a lot less. So, I mean, so that's CNG, that is fossil fuel CNG in Trinidad, but what we're producing is biomethane. Once you compress biomethane, it works even better than CNG in the CNG kit in the car. So your car, after this upgrade, your car becomes like a bi-fuel car. You could still drive on your gas, but you could also drive on what we produce for less. Um, so how we're building this business is we have this target that the average person should, should not pay more than half what they pay in now to drive every kilometer. And so our aim is that is the, 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 um, the sale price at the pump for the, the um, customer that they will save half of their monthly gas bill when they convert to our biofuel. The thing about it is all of these feedstocks are available locally and so there's no international pressures on, on the cost of this fuel. We could set the bar locally and set the, the market locally for our um, biofuel, which is I guess it's one of the things, the spirit of sustainability is that people should be able to afford to get around. And um, we're saying um, we'll set that price point in a way that the average person in the country feels um, like they economically benefit from our fuel. But what of the waste products from biofuel production? Well, Dr. Henry asserts that the byproducts could be of benefit to agricultural sectors. We don't have any hazardous waste coming out of this system. One of the things is when you upgrade biogas to make it into natural gas, well, equivalent to natural gas, which you call RNG, renewable CNG. There's a few things you have to remove from your biogas. So one of them is carbon dioxide. One of them is H2. Another one is um, some hydrogen sulfide that will have to be removed. So we are using anaerobic digestion to produce methane. That's not a secret that the way it produces methane and natural gas is from anaerobic digestion. The product is a very rich um, plant fertilizer. And so, and there are great examples already in the commercial space like Red Diamond that use sargassum seaweed to produce um, fertilizer and so, we are saying the, the byproduct of our anaerobic digestion is also going to be um, a beneficial fertilizer. And we've 
been in discussions with people like Red Diamond that that is a, a way to even probably add to what they're doing. Um, the spirit is just one of collegiality and building with existing solutions. But yeah, there, there'll be a lot of fertilizer output um, from the anaerobic digestion process. It's a very circular solution. So we're seeing, we're taking waste streams and producing a lot of useful outputs. The beauty about it is the local economy. So we will work with local agriculture for, for example, the, the black belly sheep manure. We are working locally even in terms of right now for sargassum collection, I'm getting a lot of contacts within fisheries and actual fishers. And so we're seeing this solution pulling on people in fisheries. It's pulling on, um, I think, in our all the feedstocks, agriculture. It's pulling on the rum distilleries. So their wastewater is now repurposed as something viable, useful, economically beneficial that gets rid of their problem. Or how do I get rid of all this wastewater? Um, so that's on the solution side, but also even on who benefits, who are the beneficiaries. The hotels will benefit. Um, we're in the middle of producing an app right now, which says, okay, that big blob is heading to the Korean beach in four days from now. Let's go after that blob. Let's harvest that blob. And the thing is, I am not one for, let's just go in the ocean and harvest all the sargassum and there'll be none left because that too is uh, moving away from sustainability. So the fact of the matter is sargassum is like this beautiful oceanic rainforest. It's absorbing carbon dioxide, great. It's helping in some ways. Um, so we just want to harvest the bad mats, the mats that think, ha, I think I want to go and sunbathe on the Korean beach in four days from now. That's the one we're going to catch and make sure he does not get to the Korean beach. Or we think in our fisheries, uh, the mats have been known to disrupt fishing where the fishers land and where their boats are, like they've had to move around and kind of accommodate sargassum, even where they go to fish in the ocean. So we just got funded by an a EU-funded grant called Hit Reset. So we just won 300,000 euro. And the two primary outputs from that grant are to build this app. It's called the Sargassum Biomass Prediction App where we're looking at satellite predictions of sargassum but attaching biomass to the mats that you see coming in the satellite imagery. And how we're doing that is going local and collecting local ground truth data using drones, using other kinds of technology to look at the sargassum near field while comparing it to these far field satellite predictions of sargassum. So we're doing that. But we're also setting up the, the pilot biogas station, which I kind of spoke to earlier. So we're saying in the Hit Reset project that we have three beneficiaries, which would be the energy industry, but also fisheries and tourism. Various sectors may benefit from this venture. How have stakeholders responded to this news? Even at the start, when we were going to potential partners like the distilleries, the energy companies, everybody welcomes this innovation. Um, like I said, we are etching a pioneering path going from lab, which we're sitting in this lab, dumpy labs that you remember from undergrad and you're happy you don't have to come to anymore. But we're here in the, in the academic space and we're etching that path to the marketplace and it's a new path. But so far, the reception has always been positive on the academic side, on the government side, on the potential user side, on the private sector side. We see a lot of positive response. So, yeah, this is something we were thinking about doing. This is something we'd be thankful for because of all of these number of factors. So I would say we have a positive, receptive environment. Because it's Barbados, I would say if we were trying this in Trinidad, it would have probably spun a little different because of the energy, because of the easy access to oil. In, in a place like Trinidad. But I think in a, in a Barbados where the population is forward thinking, there is a need, there's an energy need, the cost of living is high. Um, there's all of the different factors where this solution is seen as a potential benefit. I would also say Prime Minister Motley is a global icon of, of um, climate change mitigation adaptation and of the whole 
fight against climate change and the vulnerability of small islands in the face of climate change. And so here on the ground in her country, if nowhere else in the world, I expect, and it's, it's proven true every day, there is a receptivity to this, um, this concept of biofuel for transport. Well, it is widely known that many entrepreneurs endure a period of trial while establishing a new venture. What has been the experience of Dr. Henry? Everything looks hard before you take the first step. And I think every day I wake up and I say, okay, what are the 10 steps to take today? And it's just a matter of stepping forward. I found a lot of enthusiasm locally in terms of everybody I've reached out to, including in, in the rum industry to get their wastewater, including in fisheries for access to, to fresh sargassum. And every direction we turn, we see um, yeses and we see support. Um, I guess a big challenge is things like funding. So for every 10 funding applications you send out, you get two. But make sure and send out big funding applications. So when you get one, it's 300,000 euro. You know what I mean? So we've been almost full time um, grant, applying to grants. And so we have some wins, which we celebrate. Um, but there's, it's just a lot of work miles. <laughs> I'm very tired. So I think that's the big, the big challenge is the work doesn't end. It's, un, it's unending work. But every step you take informs the next step. And we have a bright team. And we have people who I feel have been unsung heroes in the renewable energy space in Barbados and in the region. And um, it's just exciting working with these people. The thing is, work is usually hard. And I think you probably don't want to agree with me on camera, but you're not always excited about work, to be honest. But in this work, there's the excitement because you know the outcomes, uh, outcomes align with your, your value system, outcomes align with the things we've been learning since we were we could speak, we've been learning about climate change. And so to actually be working on climate change, that's like a dream. I, I mean, the, the benefits far outweigh what is hard about this process. And I think, and you could probably well imagine, pioneering is always hard, and, and etching a path that wasn't there before is always hard. And you bump into the wrong wall, and you say the wrong thing to the wrong person sometimes. But I would say, all in all, the hope and the dream of what this can be is, a, is very motivating in the middle of the drudge of get the work done, get the task done, get through the to-do list this week. Um, and so for now, I don't have big complaints. I'll say it's, it's a massive chunk of work. And it always feels like we have all hands on deck. And so progress is being made daily. I think respect and the, the pace of progress is something I learned even in the process again a PhD. We started this conversation in 2019. 2023 is when we actually put in down the pilot. Um, this is after two, collecting over 200,000 data points on our fuel. And so I think innovation takes energy, it takes time, it takes heart, it takes commitment. but when is the thing that you believe in, that belief is, is a driving force in the process. And that belief helps you to get past some of the hurdles and get through some of these the, um, difficult moments in that process. And they've been difficult moments. But I would say, and I'm talking like if I talk to my kids now, if you do work that inspires you, you'll stay diligent and you'll, you'll, you'll keep waking up every day and doing the work. And so, um, that helps this process, that we, we're inspired by, by what this can be. An inspired West Indian innovator fulfilling her dreams, promoting sustainable development, and playing a role in Barbados's energy transition. This has been Info Insight. I'm Miles Eversley. Take care and thanks for your time.